can join us as we go along. So somebody else keep an eye on that because I can only see uh, a okay. little tiny screen. We should be recording now. Okay, so there we go. You've been told and warned that we are recording this session uh, for, for uh, anybody who'd like to listen to it later. Um, I think if you can help me, do we, we have a few new folks. I just want to give anybody an opportunity to introduce themselves uh, real quick, uh, who you come from and why you're here or just who you are uh, and your interest, your special interest in this. And because I can't see things, can I ask, uh, Julie, can you kind of moderate that and maybe call on people? Yeah, um, so right now, I think we did reach out to the media folks and um, like I said, I think we're still waiting on Keith to join us where we don't know if King five is able to join us, but Jonathan Martin of the Seattle times is here. So, Jonathan, if you want to introduce yourself. There, yeah, thanks for in inviting us. Um, I'm Jonathan Martin. I'm the investigations editor of the Seattle times, which means that I manage our. Our investigations team of 9 people. And then I'm also here as a representative for the newsroom as a whole. Um, we obviously have the largest newsroom in the Northwest, and we have a lot of a lot of interest in the city of Seattle and and public records in the city of Seattle. So we have a lot of observations about um, uh, issues that we've run into, particularly in the pandemic. Um, but um, some suggestions to help make the process smoother for our, for our, from our end, at least. Wonderful. Um, why don't we? let you do you know everyone else in the room here are uh, are they familiar to you or i certainly know some of them uh um but um i know the oh, city so quick. yeah maybe the city okay i'm ginger arm brewster i'm the chief privacy officer at the city i'm also responsible for the division uh, that is responsible for data privacy accountability and compliance so uh, public records has come under us about a year ago um, from another division, uh, finance and administration had had it for a few years. And so the CEPR program, Citywide Public Records Act program is under me. And we've been working hard this year to identify gaps, figure out where we are in the maturity of this program and how we can improve it. And following the directive, it came from the mayor, outgoing mayor uh, in July, the Public Records Act directive around uh, things to investigate, things to look at, things to do, uh, some of them recommendations from our end about technology upgrades uh, that needed to be made and staffing resource uh, bumps. So that's what we're here for. And I'll go a little more into kind of what we're doing here for this group in just a moment, but that's who we are. So, um, Julie, do you wanna? Um, and I believe just before we jump into that, I believe Keith oh, is, great. On, is joining us by phone. Um, there's a couple attendees in here and I don't know which is which, so I'm going to start to try to. Eleanor, we can't unmute the attendees, can we? Hey, Julie, I'm here. This is Keith Shipman from the Washington State Association of Broadcasters. Great. Great, awesome. Keith, thank you. And Roland Thompson, I'm here from the Ally Daily Newspapers. Great. Hi, Roland. And it I took think... a little bit to get on. WebEx is new to me. I know I, it works yeah. better if we have external uh, folks coming in or members of the public calling in. So. Yeah, there you are. We're good. Thanks for your patience. I think Ramsey said he might be having the same issue. Okay. Um, for the record, sorry, this is Keith Chipman. I, I was unable to log in on WebEx. I'm not sure if I had a that password, but I was able to get in by phone. Okay. So you're calling. Thanks for that. That means you probably can't see our, our presentation. Uh, uh, That's correct. Okay. Um, I'll make sure everybody gets a copy of this at the end and I'll, uh, it's, it's not, it's just keeping me on track. So I'll, uh, I'll be sure to be clear if you have any questions about anything that's on here. Let me know. Julie, are you able to send this presentation to him? Maybe yeah, I can send it. Um, and then I'm trying to request to unmute Ramsey. This is Ramsey Rammerman. I'm also on phone. I also couldn't get on WebEx. Okay. Wow, okay, what a terrific uh, uh, technical experience we're having today. I'm sorry for all of the frustration to everybody. Certainly not our goal. And when we um, when we start, we're giving everybody some time to independently kind of give their feedback. So when we get to the two of you, we'll, I'll just send a a uh, unmute request so we can do it that way. Um, so we just don't get feedback in the meantime. Um, Julie, can you introduce yourself? Yeah. So. Um, Hi, folks, thanks for your patience and I am Julie Kipp and I am the CEPRA program manager here at the city. Um, I came on from King County uh, about a year ago, as Ginger mentioned, and so our team is is growing. Um, and so I am now managing 
five individuals and our role is to support um, the 70 plus public disclosure officers. Um, we do training and trying to bring on new technologies um, and just trying to help get us into best practices. And then Eleanor. Hi, um, I'm Eleanor Bounds. I support the CTO as well as um, help out with Ginger and I manage the executive assistance for the IT department. I'm so happy to see all of you. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time. And then Norman, can you give a quick? Yes, hi, uh, my name is Norman Dizon. I'm a member of the public disclosure system review team, one of the committees that Ginger has assembled in the city. Uh, my department is actually Seattle Public Utilities. I'm the public disclosure officer for SPU, which is the water, sewer, wastewater, and solid waste utility. And I'm, I'm glad that you're all here to help us uh, improve. Thank you. Yeah, and, and thanks again for taking time. I'm going to let us dive right in because I'm anxious to hear from you all. Um, everybody can see my screen or the ones who are online. You can't. All I have is an agenda here. We're going to introduce ourselves for a few minutes. I'm going to do a quick review of a charter of what this group is about. Uh, you probably all received a copy. Just a quick overview of what are we here for. We have a baseline review of where the program is, the Citywide Public Records Act program. And when I send you these slides, there'll be a, a, a link that I believe you should all have access to. I'll make sure it's available to everybody. Call me if you can't get there to give you a, a broader view of what, what our maturity assessment was, um, where we landed and where we wanna be and, and identified some of the technologies and practices we need to get in place. But the most of this meeting is about your perceptions, your experiences, your recommendations, insights, ideas, thoughts, anything. We're hopefully gonna take over an hour to give uh, you a chance to download all that to us. And depending on how many people are in the room, we'd like to start off with a five minute kind of window for everybody to make sure everybody gets a chance to speak. And then any questions, answers, uh, discussion that we wanna do from there. Uh, and then we'll talk about next steps. This is a, a group that will continue on and we wanna talk about cadence and you know, what, what that looks like for you all. Uh, we asked Norman, by the way, to join us because uh, he's got a very wonderful perspective and has been very involved in some of the, of the uh, discussions we've had about what are best practices. And, and we wanted him to be able to perhaps answer questions. We don't do the direct public records work. And so we wanted to make sure he had that perspective in this room. So with that, any questions? Can I go ahead and get started with the charter review? I'm going to do that. Okay. Oh, but before I do, I just, for those that can see the screen, um, I imagine some of you have been in some interesting uh, situations with the city. You may have experienced times when you're frustrated. You may have been on the other end of a lawsuit from us. Uh, in this room, we're all trying to do the best we can to build a good and better program. And so I just want to assume positive intent. We're here to listen. And so I hope that uh, you know that we're listening with, with very wide open ears, two ears, one mouth for a purpose. So you're going to hear from me for a few minutes. Um, we really want to take in everything you have. Uh, and we hope that you'll understand that we're here to make this program better. So any bad or un un unhappy experiences you had in the past, I hope you can look to us as maybe different faces, uh, new faces, and we're trying to do our, our best for this program. So um, thank you for that. Action items from last time was to invite folks from the media, members of the media. We didn't start out that way because there's so many people we could invite. We wanted to hear from some of these experts. Who should we be inviting? So we did that. Hopefully some of you are in the room now. Uh, maybe more to come later. We'll see. Um, and then gathering recommendations that will be a part of a uh, actual deliverable at the end of the year. We we're supposed to talk about how do we do here. We have some things that the uh, internal re review team was doing and an annual report or memo that says what happened and what are we doing into 2022. We're at an interesting crossroads. We were talking about this with uh, Judge Downing. Uh, briefly, we have a new mayor coming in. So the, the request that came in from the old mayor will have to transfer uh, to a whole new set of uh, people in that administration. So we imagine we'll hear some more about that in January. Um, I'm going to jump into the charter. So this slide, for those of you on the phone, just gives uh, an overview of what th this group is about and why we uh, happened. Uh, this was part of the Public Records Act directive from the mayor asking for external advice. Uh, from members of, of the community of public records, folks that were involved in transparency, maybe had a legal background, folks that had public records, maybe folks who had been uh, members of the media, absolutely we want to hear from. Uh, and, and the idea, there's several points here, areas where there seem to be systemic barriers or issues around timely compliance with records requests, any policy, procedure, or training changes. This is what we're all supposed to be taking a look at here in this group. Any new technologies or tools uh, to help with retention of data or archival or production of records. Current volume and response time for requests. So talking a little bit about experiences and how we would like to see that happen or what's going on in other, other municipalities that you are interacting with. Any issues that impact the obligation of the city under the Public Records Act or the state of Washington. 
and any other concerns about specific or systemic issues, policies, or practices. And the deliverable from this group is one that we will help draft with your input, which is an annual report to the public describing what happened in the previous year, recommendations on any investments or improvements the city can make. And this is an ongoing dialogue. Of course, we called you here at the end of the year for the members of the media. Hey, I just got here. It's December and the year is over in two weeks. This will go into next year. And so the idea is that we will continue to have this conversation going on. Uh, that tag charter up, up on the slide that those who can't see it, I'm sorry, but that has a link to the entire charter. Although I think we sent this to everybody when we invited you to join us. So if you have any questions, please let me know. All right, moving on. So just very quick background. I just want to give everybody kind of level set about where, who we are and how we got here. This is a baseline of our program. And when I inherited it in January of this very year, <laughs> uh, my first move as a, as a director was to say, where are we? We've had this program for a while. I hear there's some stresses and strains. There's some technology that's been identified. We hear some complaints along the way. We have 70 public records officers that are in various forms and formats across the city, how can we make this better? And so I first needed to know where are we? And so we um, we did a maturity assessment, but the overview is this program has been around since 2014. It was a, a statement of legislative intent, a request from the legislator, let's uh, legislative side of the house to um, figure out how can we be more compliant? I think there must've been issues at that time. And just to give you a perspective, in 2014, there were about 5,000 public records requests to the city. And now there are, uh, 15,000, we expect this year, probably over that. So obviously whatever was, was stressing the system in 2014, we've just continued to grow in terms of the information that's being requested. And a lot of those requests are no longer for specific records. They're kind of any and all uh, kind of records requests trying to find uh, for a variety of reasons, more, more complex uh, or more, more data uh, in a broader sense. So that's been kind of the evolution of public records for the city. Uh, as I said, this moved to us in 2021. Uh, we have 38 departments that shifts a bit sometimes during the year, but I think we're around 38 departments and right, right over 70 full time and part time public disclosure officers. The role of this program is to provide training support technology assistance uh, and we manage uh, out of this group the intake portal which you're probably familiar with GovQA which is how we gather information and then watch the timelines and all the things that we're obligated to do so uh, we have taken on the additional responsibility this year of looking at the uh, public records directive that came from the mayor and looking at our technology the other side of this slide speaks to the maturity assessment I spoke to we got this done sometime in the first couple of months uh, of the of the year which was very timely because that's about when we were asked, how do we make this better? What technology do you need? We have an emergency funding opportunity here because of some of the issues we've had around public records. What's needed? And we had done some of that work initially without the broader intake from you all or from our own public records officers, we had been able to pull in uh, some baseline things that needed to happen. And when we did this assessment, what we, what we determined is um, uh, we're really still in kind of the ad hoc work very, very early stages of repeatable. If you look at a five, if you look at a program, it can kind of go over five, five stages before, before you really get to where we got this rolling so well, everybody wants to be us when they grow up. We're still in the beginning phases and some repeatable phases of how we run this program. And some of that is uh, a factor being an, a federated system. So while I say Public Records Act program, these people don't work for me. They, they work for their own home departments and we are here in a federated way to help support them all. So uh, in some ways, we're unstructured. Sometimes there's policies and processes that really aren't defined or documented as well as they could be, and that's part of what we're here to help uh, identify. Program management is mostly by individuals and rather than process. So it's kind of everybody's responsible for their own, and I want to be careful because Norman reminded me of this. Departments have this down. They know what they're doing. It's not that they don't know what they're doing. It's that as a program that's federated, uh, that's where we often run into how do we support these folks? What What is the SEPA program doing to be as supportive as they can? So that's not to say that everybody department land doesn't have it down and know what they're supposed to be doing this program needs that help we do however have some things that are more repeatable although largely we still have kind of a compliance approach like have we done have we done the five-day thing have we done this have we done that and there may not be as much central oversight of policies or processes um, that could be siloed uh, in different departments so what we'd like to 
to support is more consistency and coordination where, where we can be helpful to departments, especially for requests that go over citywide or large number of departments. Where we'd like to be someday is optimized. It kind of runs off the page here, but that says the program is viewed as being terrific. You were embedded into all strategic points of, of uh, business processes, were viewed as important for public leaders, all that stuff. Uh, we're probably going to work our way into defined and managed over the next couple of years where we are defining processes where we're able to provide a more coordinated response and assistance to our public records uh, community. And uh, program principles are embedded in how we do business. So we're not a, oh, by the way, public records happen. We're a public records happen. Therefore, as you conduct your business, be aware of that. And um, integrating that into our projects, integrating that into our platforms that are technology related, making sure that we're at the table when we're talking about vetting a new uh, solution to make sure our public records supported in the way that we need them to be. That kind of thing. Um, and I guess what I can say is our biz biggest obstacles that we identified were ineffective technologies that required a lot of uh, redo and redundancy that results in delays and confusion and bad experiences for requesters. And um, and also lack of dedicated resources. And so what we did uh, was um, establish that we need to update our technology around uh, public records. We also need to update our resources centrally in the CEPR program so that we can support folks through that new technology and help people who are new or who are needing retraining because they don't do they don't do frequent public records. They don't aren't as frequently as as Norman is. So that's the kind of work that we are looking at and how can we uh, make sure that we are resourced appropriately for that help. So the baseline assessment uh, in the PowerPoint, I just changed slides again, and the baseline assessment is available in this document. So as you look at this, let me know if you're having any access issues. I can also just send it to you in email. So I don't have to get fancy with uh, links. But that's where we are. And that assessment uh, informed the technology emergency funding we had and emergency funding for three public records officers in our department to support the larger community. And so that's what we've been uh, uh, chewing, swallowing, digesting over the last couple of months. So that's where we are, and this part of this group, this team that we've assembled here are people who have had experiences, good, bad, and different uh, with us and with other municipalities. You are experts in your field. You have uh, experience to lend your point of view and your perspective, and now it's time to hear from you. And so um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, I think. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing because you don't need to see that anymore. And what I'd like to do is start this process of gathering your information. and. Um, and Julie, are you going to help me with this, or should I just dive in and start calling on people? How should we do this? I am happy to help moderate, um, but I don't. We, know you just we heard a little bit from the folks who were here at last time. I'm wondering if we might hear from members of the media this time, unless you guys want to listen a little bit first. But I, I, I'm wondering if the new folks we might want to hear from you first. So, uh, Jonathan, would you like to kick us off with some of your thoughts around how the city can do better and what you'd like to see us do to improve? Sure. Yeah, um, and you know, I, before I came in here, I asked the reporters who are the ones that are doing um, a lot of doing doing these requests. And so, um, one of the um, common feedback points we got was that um, the estimates for um, installments or deliveries um, were, for one thing, they were extremely long. We're hearing, um, you know, responses that take, you know, multiple months, and then after multiple months pass, there will be a new uh, new date for the first installment and the reasonable um, language, reasonable time estimates in in the law, we feel like are um, we, feel, <laughs> we feel like there there's an unreasonable part about particularly as these installments and um, delivery dates um, kick back um, literally in some cases, you know, more than a year. Um, it's particularly a problem with uh, Seattle police. Um, we um, Lewis Cam wrote a story earlier this year about um, some of the extraordinary delays and and the, um, the basically the lack of resources to deliver um, records in a timely manner. Um, the um, we um, you know one of the in terms of the extending deadlines they um, you know we were been told um, recently that you know told like months after the original request and original delivery date that there's. It's just too much for the staffing workload. So we understand that you guys are buried under requests. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, we do, um, we do take reasonable um, on its face um, from the law. Um, the, um, the grouping policy that has emerged, um, uh, I, I think we think it's fairly recently 
um, is, it, is troublesome for us. Because effectively what it does is it punishes frequent requesters who, for our newsroom, are the beat reporters. And so if you have somebody with a direct knowledge and interest in covering, say, um, Seattle Police or the mayor's office or, you know, Seattle Utilities, um, the one person will put in a lot of requests and then have their requests then grouped together and they have to prioritize their own requests. Um, we don't we don't feel like that's a it, it basically kind of um, penalizes um, the reporters who are paying the most attention and have the most knowledge about the, the area that they're covering. Um, the we all, recently um, we've run into cases where when we ask for all communications on a topic, we oftentimes see those are interpreted as emails. Um, you know, I mean, you're, you're aware that we are suing this um, the city over text messages and we'll kind of leave that that issue to the side and um, uh, but, um, you know, it's certainly like we all know all communications does not just mean emails. Um, we want to make sure that there is I noticed in the briefing materials that there was a mention of um, standardizing methods of communication. You know, we are concerned that some um, some. I don't think I don't know if we know particularly in the city of Seattle. We actually heard we heard some chatter that in the city of Seattle, some groups were using Signal to um, communicate with each other. Um, we want to make sure that when we're asked for all communications, it captures certainly texts um, as well as emails, but then other other forms of communication, internal um, communication systems. You guys have. Um, we we we've seen evidence that um, the political staff, the communications officers, particularly. Um, are are reviewing um, records responses, which we don't think is appropriate. Um, it was particularly within the mayor's office. We that's been part of the discovery in our lawsuit. Um, obviously concerning, um, and we don't think this certainly does not comply with the spirit of the law. A um, couple other things. Um, we've we've gotten um, a really broad applications of attorney client privilege recently. So, like any communications that sort of touch a lawyer, um, get 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 um, covered in the blanket of attorney-client privilege. In some cases, we've actually asked for things that are posted on the city of Seattle's website, um, policies or, um, you know, um, uh, I think yeah, policies and even public public disclosure or public um, news releases that we realize are entirely redacted by attorney-client privilege. And then, in case we've sent that back to the records officer, say. How can this be attorney client privilege when this is on your site? We want to make sure that the attorney client privilege is applied um, accurately, judiciously. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll probably leave that to the lawyers in the room to um, help uh, um, what that actually means. Um, one recommendation that we're, we would like to make is that you guys follow what the um, federal FOIA does and has a simple track and a complex track for records. Um, it, we found, for example, we asked for a specific policy, communications about a specific policy, a handful of records. Um, and when we asked for that under FOIA, oftentimes we get it back within a week. Um, and and then we, we certainly are going to sometimes ask for very complex records. We're going to ask for everything on a topic. We're going to ask for a large data set and that kind of thing. But it seems like it's a way to, um, it, would, it would encourage us to ask for very targeted um, records. Um, which I am sure would help would help um, the city staff um, and expedites the process and maybe would reduce backlogs. Um, and then um, <clears throat> the other the other question I have is what in terms of the staffing question we hear delays we hear we don't have enough staff we're overloaded and I'm just wondering what internally if your staffing is just to reflect the volume so. If you're getting more volume, you're getting more complex ones. If you have internal targets for what you want to see happen on um, response times, and and then have the staffing um, follow from that. So that's that's a few. I mean, you asked for a candid, you know, our candid takes. Um, we understand that on the other end of this, this is a complex. The city is a complex organization entity, and you have your own challenges, but. Um, We've just been very concerned, particularly about the length of time things are taking. Um, we feel like, um, you know, our, our managing editor, our executive editor wrote recently, we feel like the public records act got broken in the pandemic and has not really um, gotten healed. So. Um, 
Yeah. And Jonathan, do you mind explaining a little bit more about the staffing in internal targets? Are you asking, you know, what do you, what do you mean by internal targets? So, I mean, you know, if, um, we wondered if you're saying, if your goal is to have 50% of your records requests completed within a month. I don't know. I mean, I don't know whatever it is, just what, whatever your, your internal target is for compliance with the records act, then is there, um, is there the resources that are being put? Is there a, a, a process by which you can put the resources in which to hit that target? Yeah, and I guess we can say there's not a dynamic uh, stable of public disclosure officers. Every department runs their own, but we're taking a look at whether a centralized office beyond what we offer from this program, from the CEPA program, could be of assistance. But I appreciate that input, and that's something for us to consider. I'm also interested in the fast track and, and larger request track. That's an interesting one. Um, may we move on to the next person, Jonathan? And I really appreciate your thoughtful. Uh, you'll have another opportunity, I think, uh, as we move on. Uh, uh, to do more uh, of that. Who else do we have here? Um, am I seeing everybody? Members of the media, who else do we have here? We we had invited Keith um, and Keith, I can see if I can unmute. Is he on the phone? I know we had. He's on the phone, but let's see. Keith, can you hear us? Are you muted? Uh, am I seeing anybody on the phone anymore? We have one Ramsey, I think was able to join us as a panelist and I'm trying to send a request to unmute to Keith. Sorry, Keith, hang in there. I love technology until I hate technology. It's a love hate. Eleanor, do you know, cause it's, it's giving me the option to request to unmute, but it doesn't look like it's going through. Yeah, same here. Uh, I think it gives us the same option. And so I think it comes down to whether or not the person is able to unmute on their end. So what do I, they have to do? Star three or six? I, I really don't, I, I don't know. It could be something so simple as, or complicated as, you know, press. Yeah, I'm, I'm really uncertain. Remember when we only got frustrated at PowerPoint? Right. I'm missing that. Maybe my, my typewriter I took to college. Sorry, I just dated myself. Um, Oh, wait, uh, okay, can you hear, this is Keith. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yes. What did you have to do okay. to unmute? Well, well, I had to hit star six, but if you would just leave me unmuted, I'll I'll mute myself on my <laughs> on my phone on my end. Got it. It's just easier Thank that you. way. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry because for the frustration. Do you yeah, want to tell us okay. well, besides choosing a different collaboration tool for these meetings, uh, suggestions, recommendations you may have for us? Um, I, I you know, echoing what Jonathan said, I, I think I think it's important that that we all act in good faith. Um, and I think sometimes that message is lost on everyone. Um, the, the media serves as a check and balance of local government. Um, you know, our broadcasters are licensed to serve the public interest, convenience and necessity. And part of that responsibility is making sure that we are helping inform our viewers and listeners about what's going on in the communities in which we are licensed, which means uh, we, you know, we have to have the opportunity to ask questions. And I, I've always been taught that the, you know, in, in my civics classes, going back to the, the days of uh, Dixie Lee Ray, which ages me, uh, I've always been taught that it's incumbent upon government officials and and their staff. Uh, to uh, behave transparently. Now, granted, there are some things that um, are confidential in nature as it relates to uh, issues of, of, you know, of, of health and perhaps issues of personnel. But in reality, if we have a cooperative relationship, I think we go a lot further than if we don't. If you know, and, and forgive the expression, but I'll, I'll go back to the 1991 University of Washington football program and the investigation that was conducted by local media and the Seattle Times did a great job with that. The more the University of Washington pushed back in its athletic department about resisting um, being transparent, the more intense the proctology exam began and became. And I think that this, this good faith effort is something that aside from the, the uh, legislation and the rules and the, uh, the the documents that are on paper and the policies and everything else, I believe it's incumbent upon us 
both sides, media and government officials, to act in good faith. Because when we have trust, we have a better opportunity to, to uh, get the truth out. And, you know, candidly, the media is not your enemy. I, I just have to say that. We're not your enemy. Um, we we want to help inform the public. That's our job. And, and I'm hopeful that as we begin this exercise and, and have these conversations, that we're able to understand that uh, we are working in a manner to help uh, our, our, our constituents, our listeners, our viewers, your constituents, understand what's going on with the local government that they've uh, invested their tax dollars in. So to Jonathan's point, we can get right down to the semantics, but you know, a Freedom of Information Act request shouldn't take six months to turn around. All that does is lead to suspicion. And, and I'm, I, I'm just looking at this from a 30,000 foot view now. And, and I hope that as we, as we uh, embark on, a, on an opportunity here that we, we might be able to clean the slate up a little bit and understand that you know, what we all wanna do is act in good faith. And, and, and while that isn't uh, focusing on the mechanics of what you wanted to discuss today, I, I think that's where, where broadcasters would weigh in at this point. I appreciate that input, and I think um, uh, I think that's what we are trying to try to reset uh, uh, at the city uh, after kind of a long, stressful couple of years. I think uh, finding better ways to work in partnership and what processes mm -hmm. we can put in place. I'm sorry, MIT. I kind of think in terms of like the, the solution side of it, um, uh, but we'll we'll continue to to work on that together as we talk about get into the details. Um, so thank you for your contribution there. Yeah. And I do want to say I appreciate the fact that you're taking the time to uh, go through this exercise uh, it's, it, and, and try to, you know, to reset. Um, I, I think that's the first step in restoring good faith. Thank you for that. I was going to say that too, going through my list. I really do appreciate you guys having this, having th this effort is, um, is great and really appreciate you guys hearing from us directly on this. I oh, appreciate that. All right, who else did we have calling in? Didn't we have another person or did they, they were able to join us? Was that you? I think Ramsey was able Ramsey. to join us. Okay, did we get any other new members of the media that we had asked? I think I think that covers everybody and we'll just go yeah, back. Yeah, I don't think we have King Five on. Okay, well, how about we start? Well, I've just invoked your name now, Ramsey. So now I feel like I have to call on you next and ask if you wanna add to what we may have been talking about last time but didn't have full, full time to uh, explore. Did you have some recommendations, things that work, things that don't, things you'd like to let us yeah. think about? Um, I think the, the, I think 1 of the challenges that we have, um. Is agencies responding is that I, that, you know, I think the, uh, the Jonathan's, um, uh, you know, points were really interesting, but I think we have to keep in mind the. You know, the requesters that we get is, and I'm sure Seattle's the same. I know Seattle's the same. Um. You know, some of it, you get some media requests, but you also get a, you also get your, um, you know, non media requesters um, and the media folks in my experience are always the best to work with. Um, but you get a lot of people who are very unreasonable that make a really large requests as well. So if we're trying to find a solution, we got to keep in mind that it's. It's not just as simple as having, you know, large media requests from reasonable people. Um, there's also a lot of unreasonableness that goes into it. Um, and I think that, you know, so um, mentioned things like the grouping policy. Um, you know, I think that if we want to get, you know, really make a difference, we've got to look at, you know, what can we do about um, the, you know, requesters who are abusive of the system um, because it's a very real thing. And, um, and it, but it, I mean, it, it's not the media that's doing that, but they're, you know, we can't, we can't take the identity of the requester into account. So look at solutions on that. Um, and also, I do think we talked a little bit about the end um, that uh, Roland did about, um, you know, the issue of records creation and what can we do on that end. I think that's one of the areas that we could, you know, really make a difference is. If we could, you know, be figuring out ways to code records at creation um, that would allow us to identify, you know, records that don't need further review. So when they get caught up in the search, we know they can go out because they weren't marked ahead of time. 
Um, obviously, a lot of federal agencies are able to do that. There's got, you know, I've certainly got a lot of ideas on it. I don't have the technical knowledge, um, but uh, as far as the practi practical knowledge and, and how to implement that or how to, you know, train people to identify confidential stuff, I think there's a lot that can be done there, um, but it also needs a technical solution that goes along with it. I think that's a, a good call. Um, I think one of the efforts we've had is what do we do about frequent requests? What do we do about data sets that are created? And how do we make those available to others if they may also be interested in them? If they don't contain information that should be redacted, uh, that we have to be cautious about. Um, uh, so thank you. Is that uh, for right now kind of what you wanted to add to the conversation? Yeah, for right now. I'm interested okay. in what everybody else has to say too. I know. Okay. Um, in no particular order, Michelle, would you like to, uh, I know you gave us a lot of good information last time. So I'm looking forward to what you might want to add to your, to the conversation. Here today. Sure. Um, I was have try, trouble keeping within your 5 minutes, so I'll go through this um, for benefit of Keith and Jonathan. 1 of the things I suggested when we talked the 1st time was a significant problem I've seen with Seattle. And this may have been right about the 2014 sudden jump in PRA requests you saw. Was Seattle made a choice to carve itself up into a bunch of mini agencies and require requests to go to different PRA officers for different departments, which requires the public and often the media who doesn't know which department has what records to make requests to many of them. I've had to, for clients, make requests to all of them. So one request now is 19 or however many departments you've carved yourself into. The other problem is the siloing that results is that because of that. That department knows what exists. The other one right next door may be represented by the same city attorney has no clue. And when they get sued, that causes problems for the city, but it also causes a lot of wasted staff time and extra work. Um, I think the way the city is doing it now is causing it to have more problems. I think the way that I would look at it, and I appreciate you come from an IT background because it's sort of what I think of. If you're going to solve a problem, think about its end use. And the end use for records created by the city of Seattle used by the city of Seattle should be that those are public records, which likely will be asked for likely will be subject to disclosure. Yes, there will be certain exemptions, but I was taught when we started. Uh, representing people that 1 should assume that everything said in an email, everything said in a text, everything written down might end up on the front page of the Seattle times. So the idea is don't say it if you don't <laughs> want to see that happen. But the assumption being, and this was from a, a CLE taught by an assistant attorney general on the PRA, uh, that you should assume everything is a public record. And if you think of it that way, then you think of streamlining ways that things are retained, things are stored, things can be searched, so that you don't ever go to the user or the creator of an email or text and say, hey, the Seattle Times has asked for all your communications on this subject. What do you got? Because there will be human um, censorship happening there, which will then result in liability. Instead, you do what you would do with a with a human resource type investigation. You have an IT level person do a search of a server and find what exists. And people who are not the authors of those messages be the ones to review and decide what's responsive. And you never let the human being who might be embarrassed by those messages be the one to decide what to produce and what not to produce. Um, I think you can solve that with email rather easily by having it be a central server with central IC searches. And you can then, yes, go to the various departments and discuss search terms. You can discuss with the cert with the user what are search terms that might make sense. The problem I've seen is departments and individuals develop code words or just ways that they talk about things that are not always going to be intuitive to the to the rest of us. And so you have to do a broad search. But you can do that at the IT level in a heartbeat and then from there work on what's responsive. The other thing I think that the city and many agencies fail on is this idea of automatic retention. And so, for example, when the Nissen case came out, there were a number of cities that adopted policies telling their staff, you shall not use your personal cell phone. You shall not use your personal email. For, for agency business and if you do, here's what you have to do to get those messages over to our server. The city of Kirkland, I think, has a fairly good example, largely because Toby Nixon of Watchcog is one of their council members and I think has really worked with them on this. But there are policies already out there. MRC ha MRSC has a number of them 
that the city could use to make sure that their employees understand don't use your personal stuff. And if you do, here's what you must do immediately to get those over again to the central server so someone else pr produces stuff. And it isn't a matter of going to individual users. When we're talking about things like applications and cell phones, we have to have a mandatory retention that is not allowed to be varied by the user. What happened with the mayor's text? What happened with the chief of police text? Um, the idea that someone was allowed to alter those settings so that they only were saved for what was it, 30 days? That never should be allowed to happen because it isn't the medium that determines whether or not something is a public record and subject to retention, it's its content. And if it's already been deleted, no one ever sees the content. And I think, again, if your goal is to avoid liability, you want to put those in place at the beginning. Uh, but also, if your goal is transparency and helping the public understand, you want to make sure those are around so that you can explain, so the public can understand. The other point is, I think, kind of going back to what the federal government does and what a lot of other agencies do, is when someone asks for something, assume someone else is going to ask for the same thing. And so come up with ways that you can use all the hard work you've already done and put it out there so that you don't have to ask again. The Public Disclosure Commission, which I know Judge Downing serves on, does an awesome job with this, with all of the mandatory filings. You can just go to their website, you can do a search, you can download the form. You don't have to go make a public record request for the candidate form. I know there's some pushback on certain things maybe they don't want to post. Courts do the same thing. You can go get court records by searching and downloading. You don't have to go to a human being anymore. There is no reason that a lot of the normal standard things that the city of Seattle creates can't get saved somewhere that a person can do a search and download it themselves without having to involve a human being to go and find it. One thing I've seen cities do, I think Kirkland might do this as well, is to have a place online where all the public records requests are tracked. You can click on it and see what the person asked for. You can then click on what they actually got, what the responses were, and you can see them. And so if you want the same thing, say you, Jonathan, want to know something that I don't know, Tacoma News Tribune was looking at, you could click and see what did they ask for? What did they get? I don't have to make my own PRA request. It's right there. Um, the public can do the same thing. So you're not having multiple requests for the budget, multiple requests for, you know, the minutes or a policy discussion or whatever it is. But I, I think all of these things require that we first start with the understanding that everything is a public record and disclosure is actually good. I take issue with this idea that the public is unreasonable or abusing a system when they're asking for their records and they should be things they're able to access without a lot of delay, without a lot of cost to them, the taxpayers. And that the flaw, the flaw really is the systems that have been put in place where I think that message hasn't gotten down to every level of staff person and sometimes isn't even at the official above. Uh, they don't want to give stuff out and have found ways to have it not stick around or not be produced. And I think we need to flip that if we really yeah. want to have any efficiency and any transparency. Yeah. You know, before I just, I love your comments. We've captured them. Oh, I was hearing myself. Sorry. Um, what I did want to tell you before I ever came close to this as a privacy officer, right? So I, my job to protect the public and the data that they provide to the city for the purposes of, you know, other things. And uh, some of the conflicts are going to be really interesting for us to talk about. But in terms of abusive uh, requests, I, I just want to make make sure you know that there are times and there are individuals who put in uh, requests that are almost punitive <laughs> in what they're doing. And we had an individual for a while who. Uh, uh, wanted every week he put, he had it on a bot. Every week he wanted every video that the police were creating with body cams. Every single one. And every single one of those videos needed to be redacted. I mean, it finally got to then 20 years, we'll get to the end of your request because truly the volume is so crazy and there really is no way to automate some of that work. So we'll, we're gonna have a really great conversation about, um, about some of that because uh, it is important that we know what we're talking about when we, when we throw out terms like that. You know, oh, for the, oh, I, go ahead. One of my points, Ginger, I have been called an abusive requester by agencies oh, throughout okay. the state. And that is because as a lawyer, as the as an officer of Watchdog, yeah. yeah. I've made lots of requests that we legitimately wanted uh, sure. and intended to do legitimate things with. And I've represented a lot of people that other people yeah. call abusive requesters. Um, we but you know, there's a reason they wanted it and maybe they didn't tell the agency why they wanted it. Yeah. But yeah. my point is 
and I understand, I know the request you're talking about for the dash cam videos. The point is they're public records and he had a right to them. Maybe he didn't do it in the most, you know, politic of ways, but had there been a more useful way yeah. of yeah. providing them? And I think I the goal was to, to drive them, to create them and to store them in a useful way. He yeah. didn't need to have that staff. Yeah, I hear you. So, anyway, I, love, so I just I take I take issue and just in general though with the yeah, idea that asking yeah. for something that should be yours is somehow being unreasonable or being abusive. Okay. Even if your goal is to be bad, sometimes it's to test the system. And yeah. I think yeah. once they see your system works, they'll stop testing it and they'll move on to the next. I appreciate that. Thank you, Michelle, for your comments. Um, in no particular order, uh, Roland, do you want to give us some comments and add to this conversation? And Ginger, before we move on, I just want to flag thirty minutes left. We're gonna get oh, there. Just, it's Roland. I brought up the point that Ramsey reinforced about managing at intake and and to have the city in the long term. I mean, the short term group is great, but in the but in the long term, for data management and retrieval, you really should have people uh, flag their flag their content in some way so that they they know they they have a pretty good idea about whether it's whether it needs to be reviewed or doesn't need to be reviewed. And I think that that will make quite a difference in terms of your turnaround times. I, I don't really make records requests very often, maybe a couple of year. And so I'm really not the person to talk to about this, I think, in terms of the details of it. Sure. But I, I'm really heartened by this going forward. I also think that Michelle is absolutely right. The people that create the records should have nothing to do with the disclosure of the records. It should be put in the hands of professionals that do the review yeah. and uh, they shouldn't be able to be allowed to set the terms for how long the the messages exist or don't exist or whatever it is too that's that's really problematic for you i'm sure and it puts you in a position of having to defend something that's almost indefensible as evidenced by the problems that the current mayor is in on her text messages yeah that's about it well, thank you. If you think of other things in the course of the conversation, we'll count on you to jump in. Thank you. Um, okay. So let's see, where are we? Uh, Eric, may I ask you to tell us what you wanted to share? Sure. Excuse me. And I'll, I'll try not to repeat uh, what everyone else said. I mean, I agree with all of Jonathan's comments and uh, Michelle and Roland as well. Um, uh, it, to, to the point about when Ramsey was speaking, I sort of Jotted down that I want to rise in defense of the unreasonable uh, requester. I think that's already kind of been covered, but um, and you know, and Ramsey knows this. Ramsey and I edited a, a desk book on public records uh, uh, together, and you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter whether the request is you know in in the view of some city official or or anyone else reasonable or unreasonable. If they're entitled to it, you know, you all have to figure out a way to respond to it. Um, I, I do think one of the reasons that you've seen um, records requests uh, go from what was it five to fifteen uh, thousand or tri triple over time um, is in some ways a, a reflection of public distrust, which um, frankly the the city through some of the you know, incidents that have been mentioned already on this call um, has earned. You know, if the public perceives that. Um, political leaders are, you know, communicating by signal uh, law things um, or, or, you know, not setting up, um, you know, their texts to be to, to be retained. Um, you're, you're inviting scrutiny and that scrutiny is going to come in the form of, of records requests. So I think one way to reduce the administrative burden on the city, um, you know, and, and the number of requests is, you know, behave better. And I think one, one of the things I would put on my list is, um, you know, I know you all do public records training, um, but, you know, it needs to be more robust, more geared toward you know, implementing a, a real culture of transparency and particularly geared toward, um, you know, incoming political leadership when administrations change. I mean, every, you know, I, I, I'm the, probably the junior person on this call. I've only been doing this for about 24 years and seven mayors. Um, and it's sort of like you know, Tolstoy's novel. I mean, every administration is bad on transparency issues. They just find different ways to, to be bad. And uh, you, you need the new people coming in to, to know not only what the rules are, but you know, what, what the consequences are and 
you know, that we know you would prefer as an elected official to not to, to be able to communicate by text about head tax meetings or, or you know, pick, pick your pick your topic. Um, but you can't and you're going to get in trouble for it and um, yeah. it's going to cost the city money. Uh, so, so that's item one is, is, you know, a more robust, um, training program. Um, number two on my wish list would be, uh, something that's been alluded to on this call already, which is, you know, figure out a way to unfederate or confederate and, and centralize at least the administrative part of, of the public records, um, uh, process and function. I, I personally think a centralized, uh, public records office would be a, a Great idea if it's done correctly. Um, I think the challenge would be to figure out a way to preserve kind of institutional knowledge within within individual departments. And so maybe you have a subject matter expert in each department, but it all funnels through a, to a central uh, IT office. And I think if you're going to do it now uh, at the outset, it should have, and I said this in the last call, it should have baked into it some kind of outside uh, review. I called it a civilian review panel. Um, but, but some group of outsiders, uh, you know, media people, Washcog, unreasonable requesters, whatever you want to call it, um, to, to at least check in on, on you know, how, how, how the city is doing yeah. um, and, and to make suggestions like this. Um, and the, uh, the, the third item on, on my list, uh, which hasn't been raised yet, is, uh, you know, I think the city needs to do something um, with the, the setting some criteria around third party notice and when it's giving people named in records the chance to weigh in uh, and, and object to requests. Um, there are times when that kind of notice is appropriate. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, <laughs> uh, there, there are there are times when it's appropriate to, you know, alert an employee who's named or, or, or uh, uh, you know, a, a business whose trade secrets, you know, might be in a record and the city can't tell whether or not they're, they're trade secrets. Uh, but it's done too often and, you know, you, you, you can have a motivated uh, objector to records who, you know, with, with no basis or garbage exemptions, um, hold up a request for, for years and years. I mean, the Times, the Seattle Times right now is litigating over uh, uh, records where third party notice was given um, and the, the objections to records that were released to another media outlet, you know, a, a year before they requested them. So you know, they're, they're already out there. Uh, so that that's something I think uh, I think needs to, needs to change. I think that's my list. So thank, thank you, you again. I was just going to say, I hope we can uh, keep keep hearing from you on those. And uh, I'm going to, if I may, move on to Judge Downing and uh, see if you have some things to add from your experience. Yeah, my experience these days is of uh, uh, occasionally mediating these disputes. Had one with uh, uh, Jonathan recently in a different governmental agency. So I tend to be something of uh, uh, the um, cheerleader, I guess. Uh, Keith and, and Eric have both uh, spoken in sort of glowing terms about the notion of a, a shared mission of transparency and informing the public. I think I mentioned to uh, Ginger um, recently that I'd heard a hidden brain segment on NPR recently where he was talking about the different difference in the way people feel about um, begrudgingly sitting in front of their computer monitor like this at work, but then happily sitting in front of a computer monitor to play video games. There you uh, go. And, uh, and yeah. Shankar Adantam said the difference is the, the sense of narrative that comes with the, the video game that uh, that leads to an involvement and a personal commitment um, uh, that makes the experience more pleasurable. And so what that made me think of is the, the PDC down in Olympia. When I started working with the PDC, uh, I was struck by how everyone that works there um, has this sense on a daily basis that the things they do in their job are important to see that the public is informed about uh, about those matters that are um, you know, the, the public is entitled to. That's a smaller agency than the city of Seattle. Um, the specific goal of the agency is transparency. So uh, it would be difficult. Uh, there'd be obstacles certainly uh, to transfer that sense of commitment to uh, across the board in the city. But it seems to me that uh, whatever can be done to um, further that goal through centralization and through training uh, I think that that is certainly a, a worthwhile thing to do. 
there's a mention of federation. So let me do like they do in the US Senate and say that I would yield the balance of my time. Yeah, oh, well, thank, well, thank you. Jen. I appreciate your perspective. Um, I'm going to move on to Poppy. I think we just have a couple people and then we can have maybe a, a follow around a follow up round. So Poppy, if you can share your thoughts with us. Great. Yes, and I will keep my feedback brief. So USA facts. Our goal is similar to what I think you're trying to accomplish, which is making government data accessible to the public. And so we have started with federal data, state data. So we haven't quite got to city of Seattle yet. So no complaints in terms of um, how we've had any obstacles in terms of accessing your data. So I think that probably the most that I could contribute is just um, to think about what we've tried to do at USA Facts, which is how do we centralize government data? So I think this is uh, something that came up from various feedback so that it's really easy to access the data that you need through one point of contact through one place that has all of the data that you would need and how by default is government data assumed to be publicly accessible to citizens. It's the people's data, they fund it. Um, so it should be uh, very uh, accessible um, and available. And so, you know, we'd love to see the city of Seattle set standards uh, for agencies, for departments that your data by default should be public and how are you going to make it accessible with the goal of hopefully um, not reducing requests, but that requests could really start being filled very easily, um, either by individuals uh, receiving the link and being you know, told, here's how you can self-service access that information, or it being really easy for um, those 70 full-time and part-time officers to be able to provide that information. I think the number, you know, 15,000 requests was mind-blowing. A staff of 70 also surprised me. We USA Facts, we have a 35 staff. We you know serve. They're not full. They're not full time. So I'm not like full time. Two percent. Three percent of their 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 day is public records. I don't want you to think there's 70 people running around doing this. Uh, only okay. a handful. Really, only partial of those are full time. Sorry. Okay, fair. Okay. Yeah. So I was thinking. I mean, still, that's like over 200 requests a person, right? So um, it must be hard. I'm assuming it's also very hard for them to fulfill these requests. So like, how do we make it easier for people who work for City of Seattle to access that data? And then how do we, by default too, make it just easier for the, the public to access that information? So I'd love to jump into this data with you. The police get half of that. They get half of the 15,000 and then it kind of trickles around. And so some poor department like parks suddenly found themselves uh, hosting a lot of these this year because of events. They don't usually have that many, so we have, you know, what I'm so you end up with a very interesting load balance because it's not 200 each. I wish it were. It's you know two over here, 15,000 spread out over maybe the the major departments. It's a really I'll show you the data sometime. It's, That'd be fantastic. It's graft. It's it's an interesting argument. You know, it's a very interesting thing to, problem to try to solve. So I appreciate your thoughts on that. One thing I will tell you, I'm responsible also for the open data team. So we have something like five six hundred uh, open data sets. Uh, I was on the phone with somebody in Dallas. Where open data by law, you make them do it. Wouldn't that be nice? Then we don't have to beg and plead and ask. It becomes no. This is your obligation, and what data sets uh, will you put on online? So it's an interesting argument because then you have the privacy side of it too. And some of the requests we get are very private information, or we have to be careful about you know who's asking and why, and because all their information becomes public, which it should be. But then you know, did they expect to make a request for whatever reason they were doing it, and suddenly they're there I am on the on on the same on the other end of that equation. So interesting things to talk about. Thank you, um, Morgan. May I ask you to kind of close this first round down, and then we'll see where we are from there. Yeah, happy to do that. You know, obviously, it's a slightly different perspective than others that are on the call. I, I talk with a lot of uh, people who individuals who've made requests to the city. And, you know, before I jump into that, you know, the idea, and I talk with folks about, you know, Michelle made this comment, and my predecessor did this in trainings, and I do this in trainings that I give now about, you know, whatever you put in writing, think about, you know, where that's going to end up. Um, and, but that goes to the idea of, you know, data management and, and records management. And, you know, I, I'm a huge advocate and a huge fan for managing records at the time of creation, which creates this inherent tension between who's going to be doing that, who's tagging those records as being protected or privileged. If you, it's not the person creating it, then who else is it? And it's, you know, it's just, it's a staffing issue in a lot of ways. And so it, 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 it's, it's, there's an inherent tension with that, but I'm a huge fan of the, of open data and, you know, of, of doing that at the time of creation. Getting to where I was starting with the uh, the biggest issue I see and the folks I talk with is some of what Brendan was talking about with um, 
just the uh, the time delay and uh, you know in light of everything going on with seattle uh, i get emails and total phone calls from folks asking about you know is this a reasonable period of time well, how do we, how do we know this and they're telling me i'm not going to get a police report for four or five months or six months or things like that um, and there's obviously lots of factors that go into that um, and you, you talked about just a number of requests one of the questions i had was how is how is the how is the department's how has it changed over time um, if we went back 10 years and looked at your staffing models to where you where you are now, because that's where the work comes in. It's easy to get the request in. It's easy to send the five day letter out. Um, mm -hmm. Searching takes some some time, obviously, and I, I'm with folks in terms of centralized searching, IT doing email searches and things like that. It's more expeditious that way you know it's done properly. Um, but where the time sink, sink comes in is, you know, what does it take to review all those records? Because people aren't cognizant of what they're putting in records. And so you have to read through everything and look, oh, hey, look, there's a social security number that should never have been put in an email, but we still have to find it. Um, and yep. so that's where the, that time piece comes in. So combination of what, if you look, look at the staffing model, how has that been addressed? And then what technologies are you using to make that happen as expeditiously as possible? Um, obviously in the discovery realm, the, you know, the, the attorneys that are really familiar with, there's lots of software programs out there that can expedite that but the paralegals are still reviewing all that material, making sure it got it right. And so the, that's one piece of it. And, you know, there was conversations about, you know, looking at the media requests and, you know, I, I, I do what I do for the state in, in, the, in this program because I'm an advocate for open government and I believe in it. Um, but in, unfortunately, the media is, and I'll reiterate, is some of the best people, easiest people to work with because their interest is just getting the information. But if you look percentage wise, you know, usually media request is only, uh, two, three percent of an agency's request versus mm -hmm. the biggest requesters are always individuals. And so it's this media request and everybody's is just getting it gets into this pool and just there's a lot of people asking questions, which comes back to the only really effective way to get that out there, because um, you do have all these data streams is what's the resources being dedicated to it, um, yeah. which is always a big question for a big agency. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I if I can go back to that tender topic of abuse, because I. I don't I don't want to wade into an area that that hurts, but I but I do want to say that we are weighing against some of the excessive requests. And then how does that delay the request to the media and folks that have a timeline that they're trying to address? We're supposed to take these in order. That becomes really interesting because the volume of requests can make that very difficult and, and, and something not everybody has access to. But wouldn't it be interesting to give you all access to how many requests are going through and what those are right now? So something we're talking about. Uh, yes, Julie. Yeah, one question that I had, um, especially for the media folks, because we're talking about, you know, it'd be great to put out open data. And I'm just trying to figure out, which I agree, you know, like, but I'm trying to figure out what does that actually mean? So for, for the media folks, is it, you know, for example, like the vaccines coming out, like, is it something where if we're being more proactive and saying like, all right, here are the numbers for these types of things, is that something that's useful to you? And then from there, do the reporters kind of like take a step back, say, yes, like one, it's building trust. We know where the city is standing on this. And then it's going to take a, a little bit of time to kind of figure out where we're going to develop these stories. Because it is, it is a balancing of resources and we are working with the open data team and we're struggling to say, okay, but data, like, what does that mean? And on a lot of times public records are very reactive, right? So they're, they're coming up with, it's easy to say, if we have a new initiative, put it out there, but some of it is we start getting records in because an event has happened or, or something like that. And so we're kind of on our heels a little bit. So I'm just wondering, like, you know, what, should we be focusing on certain types of things for the open data? Like what, what would help for, for those types of things? Speaking on behalf of the media, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, there's different. I think you you will know what are the frequent re frequent requests are. Um, so I think that if you see a similar type of request for for data, um, then making that public. Um, for example, we recently asked for payroll information. Um, I know other people have asked for payroll information. Some some um, some agencies make that very very available, um, you know, uh, going to Michelle's point about the, uh, about previous requests that are that we just, you just post online. 
Um, there are other agencies, some state agencies do that. I know Department of Health was doing that during the mm -hmm. pandemic where they were getting flooded. Um, there is a little bit, the competitive journalist to me gets me a little bit, get a little queasy about that because then you are telling your competitors what you're looking at. And as an investigative editor, that where folks are investing months of time into a story, there's um, concern. But I think if you had, um, if you had previous requests go up at a certain time after, say a month after the um, journalist asked for it, and then it became, it went in a central data, data set, a central um, database of disclosed records, that could be tremendously useful. I think King County has done that as well. Um, so um, that's okay. one, that's two things for open, open data. Um, think about what large requests you re frequently get and, and then um, post records that you've already redacted and, and, and given out before. Yeah, that, that we're, we're looking right now at what comes through our portal. Uh, not everybody does the portal, but uh, when they do, it gives us an opportunity to look through that data to see what's frequently requested. Can I tell you a funny story? Um, one of the most requested files is from fire and it's decommissioned uh, oil tanks. And we keep thinking there's got to be a way to post that. And there is, there's an open data set for it's, I guess, if you want to build something, Michelle, you got to rip up your front yard or you're doing new construction or, you know, whatever it is. Got to know where the oil tank is because really don't want to get into that. Um, it's never quite the way people want it. So they still make all those requests to fire. We think we're going to crack this code. We're going to crack this data set <laughs> so that it can be more useful to people and they can search on their own. But goodness. Um, well, we're, we're coming down to the last uh, 12 minutes or so of this. Pardon me? One thing that you might want to yeah. think about is the psychology of the building department. There is no law that governs the records that are disclosed from the building department except the Public Disclosure Act. And the building department essentially treats everything as though it's disclosable and they kind of work back from that. They give out more records every day than all of the other agencies combined. There are people that come to the counter and they get stuff out constantly. Yeah. And it's amazed me to watch all of that happen yeah. and everything that they do from investigations to everything else, they know that somebody is going to have an interest in seeing that. And yeah. so, I mean, I don't know, it's so baked into their DNA that I don't even know that they think about it. But if the rest of the agencies behave the way the building department does, because they believe that everything's going to get out yeah. because there's somebody that has a great interest in it. When you talk about the, the decommissioned oil tanks or whatever it is, I mean, everything they have, somebody wants to see and somebody is going to see it eventually. Yeah. And, and, and talking to them about how they get to that mindset is it would be an interesting uh, venture by the by you or by somebody yeah i think because they're used to permitting being public and being requestable and people need access for contracting purposes or dispute purposes there's a there's a lot and that that is interesting there is a little bit of a privacy challenge with some of the records um which we can talk about someday i get to see both sides of that and kind of go oh yes but Oh, but this, but I hear you. And I think that it's the mindset that you're interested in that they kind of get that Ramsey. Can I hear you now? I'm having problems unmuting it. I can hear you. Oh, there we go. Okay. You. Yeah. Sorry, hitting it too many times. Um, I think there was someone out of me though. What did Julie? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Julie, I think is probably, oh. is that a oh. new comment? Julie, you have your hand up still. Okay, go ahead, Ramsey. Um, so, um, I think the, uh, um, just commenting on, um, I think the, the thing that slows down requests as far as like, is looking to the building department, the thing that slows down the requests is our emails. The building department has, you know, a preset of records that we know are going to be made public anyways. They don't require the review. Um, and so that's not what's delaying requests. It's 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 the emails and other communications in general. I guess you should say all communications. Um, and I think the um, as far as one of the, there's been several comments about not having the record creator review the records. And I think this is where again, um, you know, if we could find a way to be um, coding records at creation is potentially confidential. That would make that a lot easier, but as it is now, given the number of exemptions in the public records act, often the records creator is the only person who's going to be able to identify potentially confidential information. 
And so it's necessary to have them involved in the review process simply because your public records officer is not going to have any ability to identify confidential information in some cases. So, yeah. um, but if we were, had the person who created the record put the tag on at the beginning, then it would make that so they you didn't need to go back to them. Um, right. Because they aren't going to make the final call, but it's just a matter of, of practicality. You you aren't going to be able to have a removed individual be able to identify potentially confidential information. Um, yeah. And so I think the I do think that you know we can look at what departments like the building department, um, you know what we can learn from that. But again, if it's emails, we need to look at a, a, a solutions that address you know emails and communications. Yeah. We are looking at what do we have available through the Microsoft suite because that's where we are and there are some uh, interesting uh, functionality that uh, uh, isn't made uh, available yet in the government cloud, which is what we have. So we are working hard even as we speak to try to make sure that some of the utilities that are available in the private sector around tagging, identifying uh, data loss prevention, some of those uh, utilities will be made available to us because we can use them for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, privacy purposes, but also public records, tagging, and other things. So I think um, we're we're looking into what's available to us, uh, and we'll be able to talk more about where we think our direction is. And so that's my goal for this team. We've we've figured out a whole bunch of technology we put in place. We have you guys to talk to. We've we're we're, we're doing a whole bunch of stuff. Um, next year is all about okay, how do we apply this best? How do we take these recommendations and make them work? And Eleanor's telling me to speed it up. Uh, I, I do see your hand. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to ask the last question and then I want to get our business taken care of for the end of the meeting? Go ahead. Oh, can't hear you. Darn it. We'll use Teams next time and see if it does okay. Go ahead. Oh. There, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Um, just, I don't want to monopolize. Um, Eric's point about third party notice is a huge issue for us. We've seen a lot more of it. And under the Public Records Act, when we were when we are essentially sued for asking for a public record, they there is no attorney fees that are that are um, available for us if we win. So a third party notice single handedly means thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for us. And I know we are in a position to afford that more than other media, but it's a it's a big issue, um, and, and we're going to be addressing this, trying to address it with the legislature hopefully this year. We've, we've, we've taken down all these notes. We also have this recording available to us to make sure. And so I want to talk to you about the next steps here. The next is talking about meeting cadence and when we get together again and the two deliverables we have by the end of the year. We're going to take all this stuff that you gave us today and put it in a synopsis of a, this is what we took away for this session uh, for recommendations on kind of a broad scope and maybe identify then the ones we want to drill into a little bit more, maybe in our next time together. Um, I think there's a lot of value in continuing to meet together, and I'm hoping that this group is amenable to uh, doing this in the new year uh, into 2022. Um, so we might put a question or a questionnaire out to ask you if you want to give me a quick idea. Would you like to do this once a month? Would you like to do this once a quarter? Is there value to this? And then the next time, do we do another round of presenting where we are and what we've achieved over this last year uh, against the directive that we had and some of the conversation we've had today? I'm just going to put that out there. Anybody have any thoughts they want to share about getting together again? Uh, they're mostly nodding heads. There's this. Uh, I don't know if once a month seems like a good amount of time. Probably How about next week? Time. <laughs> next week. Oh, okay. You know what? I'm a little busy next week. I, I just a little bit busy. Just a little bit. Um, why don't we put a put a meeting on the calendar for January, uh, sometime mid January maybe? We've gotten through and eaten all the fruit cake and anything else you do at this time of year. Um, uh, get get some more time and we will have put together uh, this information. So those deliverables, I'm going to be putting out to you all to make sure I didn't misquote you or we didn't say the wrong thing or we didn't leave anything out. Uh, so we'll probably put together these notes over the next week and then get them out to you uh, uh, so you can make your comments. Hey, Ginger, you completely got that wrong. You completely missed this very important point or I'd like to emphasize this some more if you have time for that. Um, and then we'll be together in January again, uh, and we will work on what that agenda ought to be, taking some of these recommendations and seeing what we can flush out with them. Of course, many of these are going to need more conversation. Uh, what sounds great in a high level conversation can get a little uh, interesting when you get into the details, as we are all well aware. But um, uh, does that all sound like a good start? Is everybody mostly available as far as they know? Uh, um, we'll look to putting out a, a time that makes some sense. and. Uh, uh, that's kind of what we had for today. I want to thank everyone for your 
candid feedback and ideas. Um, I should probably round this out by saying we're going to look at all of these and we're going to action as many as we can, but maybe not everything will be actionable. As you know, uh, we are limited in resources at the city as always, but we have people's attention right now. So it does help uh, um, in getting the resources we need and attention to those requests. Our budget cycle is just coming to an end for 2023. But there are emergency funds available as needed sometimes if there is a technology or something we need to dive into. So um, thank you for your patience with uh, this technology today. WebEx, not a happy thing. Sorry about that. We'll go back to Teams and see if that works out better. <laughs> um, any last comments from anybody uh, on the panel? Um, Ginger, this is uh, Ramsey. Um, well, obviously this was done as an open meeting. Um, is there been a determination that this group is subject to the Open Public Meetings Act? Just, and I'm asking because I don't want us to have any improper serial yeah. meetings if that's it's it's not a requirement for this uh public meetings act tends to uh be uh, policy direction other things that are done on the legislative side somebody gave me an explanation i went to law to say hey is this a thing and they said you can certainly do it there's no reason not to but we are not not every meeting is open to the public uh just because that gets a little unwieldy and no one came unfortunately so we we probably didn't advertise this so they didn't know in time or everybody just said whatever <laughs> um you know weren't interested and we have the interested parties here so no this is not a meeting we need to make public i don't mind doing it i don't mind recording it not a problem for me um we wouldn't be able to open it for public comment that that's a whole nother beast of a meeting that i do do some of those but not i think for this purpose would be my suggestion that just gets big and and uh, difficult to manage does that answer that for you? Okay. All right. Well, I want to wish everybody a happy end of the year, whatever that means for you and your loved ones. And I'll look forward to getting another meeting notice out. If you have any comments in the meantime, anything you'd like to say or uh, do or uh, reach out to us about, ginger.armbrewster at seattle.gov. Uh, and I'd be happy to field uh, any additional comments. I really appreciate all of you today. And uh, we are going to be taking all of this under advisement and getting back to you with what we heard. So. Thank you very much. I think we're done for the day. Ah, oh, two minutes to spare. I feel really happy about that. All right, everybody be well. Take care.